June 1941. Cameras roll as Nazi Germany launches an all-out assault on the Soviet Union. Operation Barbarossa, a savage and dehumanizing mission to obliterate the Red Army and massacre its population. Now, newly colorized film and amateur home movies will plunge us deep into this brutal conflict. To witness the Nazi killing machine cut a bloody scar through the pages of history and the deadliest campaign ever fought. July 1941, Soviet soldiers tow balloons through Moscow. They crawl through Red Square like a giant caterpillar. But this is no parade. These are barrage balloons, tethered with steel cables to foil low altitude bombers. The Nazis are coming. Civilians descend into the depths of Moscow's subway system taking shelter on packed platforms. The Moscow Blitz begins at night. Searchlights scour the darkness as anti-aircraft gunners look to light up their targets. Total warfare has hit the Eastern Front. Just two years earlier in Moscow, Germany signed a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union Joseph Stalin believes the two countries are allies. The Soviet Union is very serious about the new pact. I give you my word of honor that the Soviet Union will not cheat on its partner. Stalin's faith borders on denial. Ever since he began his rise to power in the 1920s, Adolf Hitler has preached about his desire to defeat the Soviet Union. So for Hitler, the decision to invade the Soviet Union goes back to his writing about um, the Soviet Union in his book, Mein Kampf, um, and his belief that you know, securing this, this land of, of milk and honey would allow Germany and its empire to expand. It would allow the Germans to become a, a healthier, more powerful group of people. By the summer of 1940, the Fuhrer is riding high celebrating the success of the German Blitzkrieg campaign that almost wiped out the French and the British at Dunkirk. On the packed streets of Berlin, Hitler now turns his attention east. Images like this are used to lure millions of young Germans to the Nazi cause. Like Gutz Hurt Rager, here swimming in the Austrian Alps, He's 15 going on 16. His father's just bought a 16 millimeter Kodak camera. A new gadget that will instill in Hurt Rager a lifelong passion for filming that will see him capture some of the most powerful images of the war that will soon erupt across the planet. Two years later, Hurt Rager begins compulsory basic training in the German army. He films his fellow recruits learning the ropes. At times, it can seem like camp. Initially, the rookies aren't issued guns, so they drill with garden shovels. Six months later, Hurt Rager and his unit, shovel still in tow, are moving out. leaving Freiburg in southern Germany on an 800-mile train journey east to Poland, now under Nazi rule, following its invasion in September 1939. The country's capital, Warsaw, is a shell of its former self. The destruction, a sign of things to come. 
600 miles away, in a German countryside unspoiled by the ravages of war, ruthless plans are being made for the future of Europe. Hitler's lover, Eva Braun, films him in the Berghof, his mountain retreat in the Bavarian Alps. Hitler loves the region and embraces its traditions. And it's here that Hitler comes to relax with the children of visiting VIPs, to play with his dogs, and to dream of his Nazi empire. In July 1940, Hitler invites senior generals to the Berghof and orders them to attack the Soviet Union the following year. A war Hitler believes will deliver the land he wants and the chance to wipe out the people he blames for all the world's ills, the Jews. In the seven years Hitler has been in power, the Nazis have been whipping up anti-Semitism across Germany. Newsreels show bang, swastika-wearing thugs screaming anti-Semitic insults. Jewish-owned shops are daubed with the Star of David, and German civilians drag Jewish neighbors from their homes and attack them in the streets. Hitler, he saw world Jewry as a, a threat to the German race. Right, Hitler's thinking about this in terms of biology. Um, he also sees communism as a threat to Western civilization. And from Hitler's perspective, and many of those in the Nazi leadership, Jews were behind the Soviet threat. The Jew equaled a Bolshevik, so he was able to destroy the Soviet Union. He could kill two birds with one stone. Nazi propaganda also focuses on another target of their hate, the Slavs found in much of Eastern Europe, portraying them as Untermenschen, subhumans that should be kicked out, enslaved, or killed. In the autumn of 1940, Hitler finalizes both his military campaign and his genocidal one. To annihilate the people of the Soviet Union, he orders a deliberate policy of mass starvation known as the Hunger Plan. The Nazi invasion is codenamed Barbarossa after the medieval German crusader, Frederick Barbarossa. Barbarossa will be a three-pronged attack. Army Group North, will push through the Baltic states to Leningrad. Army Group South will smash its way across the Soviet southern plains into Ukraine, while the largest of the army groups, Center, will attack Moscow and wipe out the city and its inhabitants. The plan is for the whole operation to be over in just 16 weeks. Hitler's decision to invade the Soviet Union was his greatest gamble of the Second World War. They needed a swift victory to destroy the Soviet Union in the summer. If it was a campaign that was drawn into the winter, they weren't prepared for that psychologically, technically, or in terms of their fighting methods. Despite facing a Red Army with almost three million men on its western border, Hitler is confident of victory. His Wehrmacht outnumbered the Soviet vanguard by a million men. And there's another reason Hitler doesn't see Stalin and his Red Army as a threat. A Soviet propaganda film shows Stalin surveying his military's collective strength. But it's a force lacking leadership. For the last decade, fearing the army is a threat to his power, Stalin has ordered the death or imprisonment of many of his leading officers. Hitler and the German high command viewed the Red Army as a, a poorly led instrument, one which had been decimated by Stalin's purges in the 30s. Essentially, Stalin decapitated his own army in the, the years leading up to the Second World War. Hitler orders Operation Barbarossa to begin in the summer of 1941. Gutz Rager is called into action. He's now a radio operator with the 29th Motorized Infantry Division. With camera in hand, 
Hurt Rager and his unit rolled toward the Soviet Union's western border. Tank units multiply until three and a half thousand panzers gather along the Soviet frontier. Johannes Schumacher also films his trip east. His unit is traveling by truck with signature license plates. Their SS Einsatzgruppen. The SS Einsatzgruppen essentially served as death squads that followed the German army into the Soviet Union. They were there to eliminate any possible resistance. Their focus was on communist functionaries and male Jews. And these were to be murdered um, by the Einsatzgruppen. By the evening of June 21st, almost four million Wehrmacht troops, three quarters of the entire German ground force, stand ready to begin the invasion of the Soviet Union. Despite reports of massing German military on his border, Stalin refuses to believe they will attack. Germany is up to her ears with the war in the West. I'm certain Hitler will not risk attacking the Soviet Union. He is not such an idiot and understands that the Soviet Union is not Poland, not France, and not even England. Many Red Army units are demobilized, far from the front line. Their guard is down. In the early hours of June 22, 1941, Operation Barbarossa begins. It is the start of the largest and most brutal conflict ever fought. Dawn, June 22nd, 1941. An eerie silence envelops the Soviet border. German troops brace themselves for what's ahead. It's the calm before the storm. Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of the Soviet Union, has begun. Nazi propaganda crews film as howitzers fire 250-pound shells at Red Army defenses, sending shockwaves along an 1,800-mile front line. With the aftershock still reverberating, the Wehrmacht charges forward. Soviet cameramen capture their troops' surprise and the ensuing chaos. In the early days of Operation Barbarossa saw the Soviets perform in a way that Hitler had hoped and indeed expected. It was a case of the Germans being able to exploit an underwhelming opposition very quickly and in a way that very much reflected the sort of success that they'd seen in 1940. Stalin is horrified. The German invasion um, shocked and surprised Stalin because according to his own um, perceptions of things, it made no sense for Hitler to attack. So when the Germans do tear open these huge gaps, these huge holes in Soviet lines, um, it leads Stalin to um, well, some historians have suggested that he had a type of nervous breakdown in which he kind of disappears and, and falls from the scene. The damage is not just psychological. Major Wilhelm Emmerling films as his division moves into the destroyed Soviet border town of Rava Ruska. Marveling at huge craters left by high explosive shells, and the shreds of Soviet uniforms literally blown sky high. Emmerling also records blasted out pillboxes and the corpses of the troops that once manned them. In the face of the cold-blooded German onslaught, many Soviet divisions are wiped out. A camera operator assigned to the 112th Rifle Regiment 
films German units moving along open roads, fields, and through villages with no resistance. The footage also shows bewildered looking Soviet POWs. Their expressions leave little doubt. They know their fate is sealed. Every military action must be guided in planning and execution by an iron will to exterminate the enemy, mercilessly and totally. Hitler addresses his high command in March of 1941, in which he gives this long lecture about that this has to be a war of extermination, that officers need to leave their scruples behind. So this meant that on the, the word of a German officer, all the men could be shot, the whole village could be shot, right? This power of life and death was passed on to um, German officers in the field. It drives a merciless assault. In the fortress town of Brest-Litovsk, defenders try to stand firm. They're hammered with a near constant artillery bombardment led by a Mirza Karl, an enormous railborne gun. After eight days, Soviet troops finally raised the white flag and surrender. German propaganda camera crews show the high price of their resistance. Stables filled with dead horses and streets littered with human corpses. Brest-Litovsk was a foretaste of what was to come for the rest of the Soviet Union. Complete destruction. Men, women, children, animals, fields laid waste. The Soviet Union was not simply to be conquered. It was to be destroyed. By the end of the first week, all three German army groups have achieved their initial objectives. Lead tank units make the most of the open fields and scattered Soviet infantry. Within days, they penetrate over 200 miles into the Soviet Union. Hitler greets the news with a bold proclamation. To all intents and purposes, the Russians have lost the war. Exhausted and underfed, weakened Soviet soldiers are captured in their hundreds of thousands. The wretched sight of their downtrodden enemy shocks even the German troops. The dusty road was lined with endless columns of Russian prisoners in ragged khaki brown uniforms. Some were barefooted and half-dressed. They filed past us with downcast eyes. Many support others who are wounded, sick, or exhausted. General Graf von Rutkirch visits one Soviet prisoner camp. The emaciated state of the POWs is obvious. The Germans make little provision for the vast number of enemy prisoners they regard as subhuman. With many forced to drink fetid, stagnant water. And use their own helmets and beanies to hold the meager rations they are given. Almost three million Red Army soldiers will eventually die of malnutrition at the hands of the Wehrmacht. The Nazis ruthlessly execute their twisted ideological war. The sign reads, these Jews agitated against the German army. It's a scene being repeated all across the Soviet front line. The first day the Germans came, they hanged eight people in the main street, among them a hospital nurse and a teacher. The teacher's body was left hanging there for eight days. 
because moral boundaries weren't in place, because ideology was a major objective, it was a case of the German soldier feeling that it was just an extension of a military campaign to move into unlawful acts, to murder, to loot, to rape, to maim. And they may have known that it was wrong, but once the moral boundary had been crossed, it was very difficult to pull back from them. Footage shot in the summer of 1941 shows SS Einsatzgruppen forcing Jews into ditches before systematically shooting them. By the end of the year, the SS will have murdered almost one million Soviet Jews, a massacre known as the Holocaust by bullets. The Nazis' genocidal campaign spares no one. To solve their food shortage and wipe out their ideological enemies, the Germans implement the Hunger Plan, an engineered famine. Rather than cover up the plan to systematically starve an entire population, Nazi propaganda films celebrate laughing soldiers as they steal poultry and livestock. The Germans knew that a campaign of this scale, they lacked the logistics and supplies. And food and supplies from the Soviet population were going to have to make up the difference. To the Germans, it didn't matter. These were subhumans anyway, lower races who could be killed. They spoke openly of a hunger plan. 20 to 30 million Soviet civilians would have to be starved to death. Barbarossa was not a normal military campaign. It was a murder campaign. Operation Barbarossa is now into his second week. With the suffering and death toll of his armies and people escalating out of control, Joseph Stalin is forced to face reality. He addresses the nation. When Stalin's speech began, his words resounded from all directions, with amplifiers carrying the message to every nook and cranny of the city. Stalin's first radio uh, address to the Soviet people was one that called on the Soviet people to come together and rise up as one against the Germans. Um, he, he demanded that the Soviet people hound and harass German units wherever they are. It was no longer the Red Army versus the German Army, but the Soviet Union fighting for survival against Nazi Germany. The Red Army scrambles to mobilize. With Stalin's words ringing in their ears and thirsting for revenge for the German atrocities, hundreds of thousands of Soviet troops head to the front. The counterattack is on. Throughout July, many Soviet forces fight with suicidal ferocity. If you are wounded, fake death. And when the Germans approach, kill them with your rifle, with your bayonet, with your knife, tear their throats out with your teeth. Don't die without leaving a dead German behind you. The savagery of the Soviet counterattacks catches some German units off guard. For the first time, the invaders start to suffer heavy losses. Mother Russia opened her arms wide in embrace. Welcome to the war. Welcome to hell on earth. In the summer of 1941, harrowing Soviet propaganda films underline the deadly impact the Red Army's fight back is having on Operation Barbarossa. And following the massive Luftwaffe air raid against Moscow, Soviet newsreels revel in the fact less than a dozen of the 200 German bombers break through the city's anti-aircraft measures. They show a burning plane plummeting to the ground. But careful inspection shows the footage is fake. The downed aircraft is a model plane hung from a fishing line. 
The Soviets use propaganda very astutely. We see the war being used to bind the Soviet people to the center, and particularly to the personality of Stalin. This was the great patriotic war, the war for Mother Russia, and Stalin wasn't going to let anyone forget that. By the end of July, Army Group Center's blood-drenched advance has driven it to within 200 miles of Moscow. But the intense opposition is knocking the German campaign further and further off schedule. And it's about to get worse. Throughout July, heavy downpours hit the Soviet Union. Dirt tracks transform into muddy rivers. Fuel consumption and breakdown soar as engines strain to wrench trucks from the quagmires. And armored half-trucks are reduced to the role of tractors. Stuck under my cape with the rain running down my back, my feet in a pool of water, I feared for the attack. I had witnessed what mud could do to armor. It filled me with dread. Operation Barbarossa is drowning in mud. For German units that were marching through this mud, this could become a matter of life and death because German soldiers were sinking down to their shoulders in the mud, and if no one helped them out, they would simply die there. The German state-of-the-art mechanized forces have fallen into an age-old trap. If in the summer of 1941, we took a snapshot of the German army trying to fight its way through the mud and the rain, you'd be hard-pressed to know whether it was the 1940s in the Second World War, whether this was a scene from the Napoleonic War, or indeed a scene from more ancient times. Infuriated by the slow progress of his forces, Hitler flies to Army Group Center's HQ, just east of Minsk. Propaganda footage reveals the Nazi leader's arrival is met by jubilant troops and the leader of Army Group Center, General von Buck. To get the campaign back on track, Hitler demands a change of tactics. He tells von Buck that Moscow is no longer the primary objective. Barbarossa will now prioritize seizing Soviet resources and use them to fuel the German advance. To achieve Hitler's goal, armored units from Army Group Center are sent north to execute a speedy capture of the industrial powerhouse, Leningrad, and south to the oil and agriculture-rich territories of Ukraine. Hitler also reiterates his desire to obliterate all that stand before him. Hitler is now branching out away from that one critical capital city objective into an economic war, as well as a military war, on top of an ideological war. It was becoming more complicated phase by phase. As the autumn of 1941 closes in, Operation Barbarossa is set to begin its bloodiest chapter yet. Hitler orders the capture of the resource-rich city and former capital of Russia, Leningrad. The protection of the city and its three million inhabitants is led by Marshal Georgi Zhukov, a veteran of World War I and a close advisor to Stalin. With the Germans fast approaching, Zhukov orders the inhabitants of the city into action. Men, women, and children frantically dig an outer ring of anti-tank ditches and barricade the streets. Tanks from German Army Group Center join up with their northern counterpart. The combined forces mass on the outskirts of Leningrad. On September 9th, the German armored units are ready to attack. German guns fire at city defenses, while the Luftwaffe 
mercilessly pounds away from above. As shells explode all around them, Soviet camera crews record the carnage inside Leningrad. And the desperate counterattacks as the Red Army tries to stop the German advance. The German army fighting in Russia is like an elephant attacking a host of ants. The elephant will kill thousands, perhaps even millions of ants. But in the end, their numbers will overcome them. He will be eaten to the bone. I think the Germans had an unrealistic expectation. A panzer division would motor its way to Leningrad and blast into the city. But the Soviet defenses have toughened, the Germans have been weakened getting there, and as a result, their plans turn to siege. The Nazis cut Leningrad off from the world. For over two years, its inhabitants are left to starve. The city never falls, but over a million of its citizens will perish. It's the longest and deadliest siege in modern warfare. While the deadlock around Leningrad plays out, the Second Panzer Army heads south to execute the other phase of Hitler's plan, the conquest of Ukraine. Villagers, all too aware of the Nazis' genocidal hunger plan, set fire to their own property, a scorched earth policy to deny the approaching German shelter or supplies. Erhard Schaumann, serving in the 20th Panzer Grenadier Division, films houses and fields torched in and around the town of Vitebsk. To further disrupt the German advance, the Red Army targets the most ambitious engineering project ever built in the Soviet Union, the Dnieper Hydroelectric Dam. At the time of its construction, the 2,500-foot long dam was the biggest on Earth. 20 tons of explosives blow a 500-foot hole in this engineering masterpiece. This rare footage shows nearby cities flooded by the resulting cascades of water. Roads, factories, and resources are washed away. The Russians have proved by their destruction of the Great Dam, they mean truly to scorch the earth before Hitler, even if it means the destruction of their most precious possessions. Ukrainian locals received no prior warning of the blast. An estimated 100,000 are killed in the flood. Soviet disregard for Ukrainians is nothing new. Many already hold a deep-rooted hatred of Joseph Stalin's rule. Many Ukrainians had suffered under communism. We have the, the famine induced during the 1930s in which several million Ukrainians die. This is followed by the Great Terror, which kind of rips its way through Ukrainian society. So for many Ukrainians, when the Germans come in, they see this as their opportunity to, to free themselves from the yoke of Moscow. A feeling reflected by this sign that reads, Long live Adolf Hitler and his army. Filmed by his personal camera operator, General Rotkir and his men enjoy ice cream with Ukrainian villagers. Later, operating the camera himself, Rotkev films locals in traditional dress, carrying swastikas, and making the Nazi salute as they parade past German officers. Another sign reads, the liberators of Europe from Bolshevism, Sieg Heil to Adolf Hitler and his men. But this outpour of Ukrainian support is met with Nazi contempt. The Germans don't view the Ukrainians as potential allies. They view them as an inferior race, as part of this 
subhuman racial grouping of Eastern Europe against whom they are campaigning. They treat the Ukrainians with brutality, murdering them in mass, raping women in mass. It's an orgy of violence in Ukraine. Sources estimate there are up to 10 million cases of rape during the German occupation of the Soviet Union. Few are punished. To stamp their authority on Ukraine, two panzer divisions, one commanded by Heinz Guderian, the hero of the French campaign a year earlier, head towards the country's capital, Kiev. For 10 days, German artillery assaults the city and pounds it into submission. Endless lines of prisoners march down the streets. Well over half a million Soviets are killed or captured in the battle for Kiev. It's a staggering loss. For the first time, the Wehrmacht outnumber the entire Red Army. Confident his forces have secured the resources they need, Hitler redirects Operation Barbarossa back to the destruction of Moscow. Almost two million German troops advance on the capital. Hitler's dream of obliterating the Soviet Union looks set to become a reality. In the first week of October 1941, the German High Command launches what it believes will be the final act of Operation Barbarossa, the demolition of Moscow. Footage from Soviet camera crews trapped inside Moscow shows its residents filling sandbags as they prepare for the Nazi attack. Anti-tank barricades called Iron Hedgehogs and other fortifications spring up across the city. Muscovites fear a siege. They bring livestock in from the fields and herd them right past the Bolshoi theater. Few expect mercy, but none know the true extent of Hitler's plans for Moscow and its residents. Hitler wants Moscow wiped off the face of the earth. He wants its physical presence to be extinguished. It will only be a memory. The death of Moscow will mean the death of Bolshevism, the death of communism, the triumph of Adolf Hitler. By mid-October, the 10th Panzer Division is just 40 miles from Moscow. The Germans decide to concentrate all their resources for one final drive on Moscow. The goal here is to end the Soviet campaign in the calendar year of 1941. It's kind of the last gasp um, attack on the capital in the hopes that Operation Barbarossa can be brought to a victorious conclusion before the onset of, of winter. But on December 2nd, blizzards hit the area hard. Temperatures plummet to 30 below. Visibility drops to near zero. It's the coldest European winter of the 20th century. The Nazis' mechanized army freezes in its tracks. Technology no longer played a role. The elemental power of nature broke the operation of our engines. What do we do now? German soldiers, ill-prepared for winter combat, seize heavy coats, scarves, and hats. Locals, stripped of their warm clothing, freeze to death in the streets. Keeping warm is not the only problem. Starving Germans butcher horse carcasses for meat. General Rotkirch witnesses the harsh reality of the Eastern Front's winter firsthand. Frozen bodies cover the fields. Rigid corpses are piled high onto sleds. The ground is too hard to bury them. 
frostbite and disease take as many German lives as enemy bullets. Over 150,000 die in just three weeks. Even as conditions worsen, the SS continues to execute its campaign of atrocity. Amateur footage shows hanged Soviet POWs, the sign declaring the soldiers beasts. In Moscow, Stalin orders reserve troops from eastern Siberia into the fight. They specialize in winter warfare and drop right into the heart of the action. Strapping on skis, the troops join up with divisions of winter-ready T-34 tanks. Wave after wave of Soviet men and machines target known German weak points. Frozen and battered German troops raise the alarm. The Soviet onslaught is a brutal and unexpected blow. The shock of, of these fresh Siberian troops proved devastating to, to German soldiers in many ways. They had seen the, the battlefields littered with Soviet bodies and Soviet equipment. It seemed that they were fighting an enemy with never-ending waves of, of troops. It broke the German belief that victory was attainable that year. The shell-shocked Germans are overrun they're caught cowering in barns and crawl spaces, or by pitchfork-wielding villagers. The Nazis' merciless treatment of their countrymen and women is fresh in Soviet minds. I cannot imagine the hatred the Germans have stirred up amongst our people. What we've got in the Red Army now is men thirsting for revenge, especially when they see some of these arrogant, fanatical Nazi swine. Soviet executions of Nazis are commonplace. Day after frigid day, the Wehrmacht is pushed back in unprecedented disorder. As December 1941 draws to a close, the majority of German forces have retreated over 100 miles from Moscow. Operation Barbarossa is over. Over 800,000 Germans and almost 5 million Soviets are dead, MIA, wounded, or captured. Numbers that make Barbarossa the costliest military operation in history. But its aftermath is to prove even deadlier. From an ideological perspective, Operation Barbarossa ushered in the Holocaust. We see the evolution of Nazi policy towards Jews in the Soviet Union, beginning with the mass murder of all male Jews. Then by the end of the campaign in December of 1941, the Nazi leadership has made the decision that each and every Jew in Europe is to be murdered. The Nazis, desperate to destroy their Soviet nemesis, dig in for the long fight. But in the wake of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, America enters the war and begins to send weapons and supplies to the Soviets. War on the Eastern Front is about to get even deadlier. 